let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Writing on matters of sex and sexuality has been challenging lately. Today I want to give you an overview of what we know about non-monogamy in relationships, what it might mean for the mating market and for marriage, and close with a few reflections on Catholic thought on sexuality in light of these numbers. British sociologist and social theorist Anthony Giddens, one of the more well-known and well-published sociologists of the last several decades, offered what turned out to be a very prescient introduction to changing sexual norms in a book titled The Transformation of Intimacy. It was published in 1992 or 1993, 21 years ago already. I started graduate school about that time. It was not on my radar screen at all. I was reading some other books of his, but not that one, in part because I was largely uninterested in the study of sexuality at the time. While his book did not contain much in the way of statistics, which is sort of what I tend to do, it nevertheless began to name some of those things that those of us who traffic in estimates and statistics and in in-person conversations and interviews now see and hear with a good deal of regularity, things to which I'll talk about several times tonight. In a blog post several months ago, pointed out to me by a gay friend of mine, the author listed myths about the origins of sexual orientation, noting that the closer to political victory in the same-sex marriage battle that the left gets, the more open it seems to be uh, in its claims about homosexual orientation's absolute fixedness. Maybe, they're saying, they may be politically helpful, but actually an insult to the persons who actually inhabit them. Johns Hopkins professor of psychiatry, Emeritus Paul McHugh, who fought sex reassignment surgery from the start, has long asserted this very thing, that the boundaries around sexual orientation are just not well understood, and suggesting that they are universally fixed or inborn just doesn't comport with empirical reality. Scholars left and right know that sexual orientation is just not quite as fixed as many claim it to be. It is, however, more fixed typically for men than for women, and in some persons more than in others. I'm not here, however, to talk about what sexual orientation or identity is, what it means, or the acronyms we should use when we reference them. I concern myself typically very little with those things. What I'm here to talk about is self-reported sexual identity and behavior and what those things tell us about the future mating market dynamics for everyone. I study young adults. One of the challenges here is that young adulthood is still a time of flux in terms of sexual identity. And getting a stable grasp on the population estimates around it doesn't typically occur probably until the late 20s or early 30s especially until self-reported female bisexuality rates diminish, as they typically tend to do. In other words, it's a lot more reliable to talk to 35 to 50-year-olds than it is to speak with adolescents and 20-somethings. Some of this may be due to personal shifts in self-reported identities, while others may be due to increasingly greater comfort in coming out of the closet. We don't actually know whether homosexuality is increasing in the population. 
Any shifts that we see can arguably be more attributed to greater comfort and self-reporting. What does appear to be happening is an increase in same-sex sexual behavior at the population level. For numbers around this, we tend to rely on three different nationally representative data sets, which differ slightly in their figures due to question wording and to when the survey was fielded. This is from the National Survey of Family Growth, it's an ongoing data collection effort by the Centers for Disease Control. We see that 78% of 24 to 35 year old women reported being only attracted to the opposite sex compared with 92% of same aged men. Just under 2% of each report being only attracted to members of the same sex. 3% of women, but only 7 tenths of a percent of men say their attraction is equally divided. So bisexuality tends to be a female thing. 16% of women lean heterosexual, that is mostly attracted to the opposite sex, compared with only 4.3% of men. That is a category to pay attention to, especially when it comes to predicting women's sexual behavior. Just over 20% of women, not on this slide, report any same-sex sexual behavior or experience in their lifetime, 20%, compared with just 6.5% of men. Just over 6% of both men and women, however, report any same-sex sexual partners in the past year. Note that 6.5% of men reported same-sex behavior in their lifetime comparable figure to those partnering in the last year. It tends to be more consolidated among men in terms of lifetime and present. In a different data set, it's a new family structure study which I collected. Uh, we see comparable numbers, right? In fact, we see comparable numbers on the NFSS in a variety of different data sets, which is why I have confidence in that data. 93% of all men aged 24 to 35 called themselves 100% heterosexual or straight, well above the 79.8% figure among women. As with the last slide, so with this slide, 14% of women, significant share, identify themselves as both, uh, as between some completely straight and bisexual, but only 2% of men said that. 4% of women bisexual, 2.2% of men. Right? So we've seen some of the same things in that slide in the last one. 3% of men said they were 100% homosexual compared with 1.6% of women. And just a note, a brief note about what might be called asexuality. Some consider it asexual orientation. Others think it's the complete lack thereof. Some of the former are pressing a case for asexuality uh, as an orientation because they're concerned that asexuality might be considered a disorder, thus bringing in its train all sorts of politics that such psychological assignments typically witness. But of course, asexuality is not normal in the sense of comprising an average experience. It may not be a bad thing. If you're pursuing celibacy, then I'm sure asexuality is probably pretty convenient. It should not be mistaken for a for low libido or diminishing testosterone, but could be confused with such. It is even a protected class legally in Vermont and New York. I do not know if it's in the end of bill or not that just passed the Senate. Interesting fact though, despite comprising a mere 1.3% of the population, the respondents in the NFSS who said that their mothers have had a same-sex sexual relationship made up 15% of all the asexual identifiers in the NFSS. So 15% of them come from 1.3% of the population. <laughs> okay, now back to Anthony Giddens, that social theorist I mentioned earlier, and our first hint at how Catholic thought becomes relevant to all of this. Giddens asserted back in, uh, I think it was 1992, he said, effective contraception, 
meaning something that wasn't widely uptaken until well after its advent in 1960. Effective contraception, he said, meant more than an increased capability of limiting pregnancy. This is his words. In combination with the other influences affecting family size, it signaled a deep transition in personal life. For women, and in a partly different sense for men also, he said, sexuality became malleable open to being shaped in diverse ways and a potential property of the individual. Furthermore, now that conception can be artificially produced rather than only artificially inhibited, he wrote, sexuality is at last fully autonomous, that is, separated from embeddedness in relationships. And he notes this important fact associated with what he called the double hermeneutic. He said, once there's a new terminology for understanding sexuality, ideas, concepts, and theories couched in these terms seep into social life itself and help reorder it. Indeed. Even I have been using the terminology of sexual orientation fairly readily, even while I tend to prefer to stick strictly to sexual behavior. In fact, part of the criticisms I faced with the New Family Structure study on same-sex parenting came from the fact that I did not ask my respondents about their parents' sexual orientation or self-identity, but only about their relationship behavior. Giddens, again, he says, the sexual revolution of the past 30 or 40 years is not just or even primarily a gender neutral advance in sexual permissiveness. It involves two basic elements, he said, one of which is the flourishing of homosexuality, male and female. We are dealing here, he writes, with much more deep-lying and irreversible changes that were, than were brought about by such movements, important although they were in facilitating more unfettered discussion of sexuality than previously was possible. Then he goes on to describe something called the pure relationship. This is not the purity that evangelicals talk about, and it really doesn't have much to do with chastity. But nor do I think he's trying to give it a value judgment. He is rather describing what has changed about how we enter and come to stay in relationships and why. He said, the pure relationship refers to a situation where a social relation is entered into for its own sake, for what can be derived by each person from a sustained association with another, and which is continued only insofar as it is thought by both parties to deliver enough satisfactions for each individual to stay within it. Marriage, he said, has veered increasingly towards the form of pure relationship with many ensuing consequences. The pure relationship, to repeat his words, is part of a generic restructuring of intimacy. It is in some causally related ways, and it takes a lot for a sociologist to say causally. He said it's in some causally related ways parallel to the development of plastic sexuality. The romantic love complex helped carve open a way to the formation of pure relationships in the domain of sexuality, and yet now has become weakened by some of the very influences it helped create. Let me unpack that a little bit. Giddens draws an arrow from contraception to sexual malleability to the expansion of homosexuality. At the same time that this is happening, we've witnessed what I call a dramatic decline in 
price of sex in the broader marriage market. What do I mean by the price of sex? Well, sex is, among other things, a social exchange. There is a basic economics that typically precedes relationships, even one night stands. And it constitutes the social setting in which they begin, end, or continue. In their 2004 Personality and Social Psychology Review article entitled Sexual Economics, social psychologists Roy Baumeister and Kathleen Foss explicate the very important economic and market principles that characterize the genesis of heterosexual relationships between unmarried adults. Each person gives the, the other person something of themselves. Although it might appear at face value to be the same something, intimate access to each other's body, there's often more going on than meets the eye. Men, on average, they wrote, are more often principally drawn to the powerful physical pleasures of sex than women are. This does not mean that women are not interested in pleasure, just seldom quite in the same way or with the same drive as men. More often than men, women's interests also include other things, expressing and receiving love, attention, affirmation of desirability, reinforcing commitment, relationship security. Men can appreciate those things too, plenty do, but they will tend to be secondary or tertiary reasons for the pursuit of sex. Men pursue sex with greater abandon and frequency. They fantasize about it more often, they masturbate more than women. Men are more sexually permissive in reality and not just in theory than women. They connect romance to sex less often. Whether they actually stray from their primary partnership or not, men direct far more mental time attention, and sometimes effort toward other potential partners than do women. Women take far fewer risks for sex. Women politicians seldom find themselves embroiled in sex scandals of their own making. So economically speaking, at least in the heterosexual world, women have what men want. Thus, they possess something of considerable value to men, something that conceivably costs men something to access. Historically, men have had to give something, most typically commitments or promises of the same to get that. The very same thing, sex, is not typically of value to women in quite the same way. Baumeister and Vos point out, women never pay men for sex. They just don't. It's not how they operate. It's probably a good thing. Economically speaking, women would never need to pay men for sex. So in the heterosexual mating market, broadly understood, there is demand, interested men, and supply. Women. Hardly romantic. I get it. But it's not untrue. So when exactly does sex actually commence in a romantic relationship in which sex is consensual and men desire it more than women do? The theory provides a clear, not uncontested answer. Sex begins in consensual relationships when women decide that it begins. From both qualitative and quantitative assessments, this claim garners support. The correlation between sexual intention and actual sexual behavior is much higher among women than it is among men. For men, their intentions and their behavior can be completely unrelated. Men's level of interest in casual sex with a stranger dwarfs that in women. The bottom line is this. Women are sexual gatekeepers within their relationships. Men tend to make bad gatekeepers of sex in their relationships. If they are the gatekeepers, they're typically easier to convince. 
Which brings us back to gay and lesbian relationships, where supply and demand are located within the same gender. This makes for a very different relationship market experience than most of us have, wherein your friends, potential lovers, and rivals are commonly located within the same sex. Conceptually, gay men's relationships are less likely to be sexually monogamous when compared with lesbian or heterosexual relationships. Why? It's not because of sexual orientation, but rather due to these very stable gender differences in relationships, preferences, and sex drive. Men in gay relationships are thought to cut more deals with each other concerning outside partners. And those deals are both easier to make and easier to realize because men typically don't function as sexual gatekeepers. And that brings us to the subject of non-monogamy. It's a mouthful of a word, kind of a polite replacement of sorts for promiscuity or infidelity. Same transformation has already happened to terms like virginity loss, prostitute, terms no longer considered appropriate in academic parlance. Remember, Giddens predicted that shift in language 21 years ago. In their place, we now have a sexual debut, sex worker. The lingo alone takes effort to master. You need an urban dictionary. But neither Microsoft Word nor most Americans affirm the legitimacy of the term non-monogamy. Maybe version 8 will take care of that. Non-monogamy, supplementing a primary sexual partner with one or more others. Serial monogamy remains the primary sexual script among young adults today. It's into that pattern that most Americans put their energy. The norm out there is that you are allowed one partner at a time. To overlap is to cheat, and cheating remains a very serious norm violation that gives the victimized party not just the uncontested right, but often a perceived moral obligation to end the relationship. But what about the general state of non-monogamy in America? Just how monogamous are young Americans? What does that say about the mating market of the future? Most young Americans, but more women than men, are still invested in monogamy, at least in theory. But chatter about monogamy and monogamish has without doubt increased in frequency. It took a large leap forward in Mark Oppenheimer's biography of sex columnist Dan Savage in the New York Times Magazine a little over two years ago. In it, Savage, who is gay and civilly married in the state of Washington, admits to having had nine partners since he's been married. He, sp he spends considerable time in that article and in his column outlining both the benefits and the costs of monogamy and concludes that monogamy just doesn't fit very many people. So the reality of monogamish, especially but not exclusively among gay men, is emerging in scholarly circles as well. It was once an open secret, since it was thought to be politically damaging to gay rights to admit it. But as support for same-sex marriage rises, and as states accepting same-sex marriage continue to increase, so has this admission. It feels safer for people to come clean about this now that same-sex marriage is a reality in many places, very soon perhaps the nation as a whole. So what does the data out there say about monogamish among the masses? Well, that it's happening. This is from an unpublished analysis of uh, National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, now in its fourth or fifth wave. They compare the stability and qualities of several thousand opposite-sex relationships with data from 201 same-sex relationships among adults ages 24 to 32. It's a very unusual population-based study, 
considered far better and more generalizable than a snowball sample on the same topic. In keeping with Dan Savage's comments, the authors of this study note that men in same-sex unions are less likely than women in same-sex unions to indicate complete sexual exclusivity, which is defined as whether the survey respondent said yes when asked whether they or their partner, quote, had any other sexual partners since the relationship began. In each type of union, whether cohabiting or dating, exclusivity rates were lower among same-sex partners than among opposite-sex ones. Non-exclusivity, 20% of married opposite-sex respondents between 24 and 32. That alone should shock us. This is among married respondents all the way up to 47% of dating same-sex respondents. Overall, the exclusivity rates of each of these groups is lower than uh, we might expect, given that the top end age is only 32. The study does not explore reasons for relationship dissolution. The authors noted that same-sex relationships display a hazard rate, statistical term, of dissolution that is 31% greater than that among opposite sex unions. The possible reason, of course, is the comparatively lower exclusivity rates in keeping with respondents' higher reports of previous sexual partners. Although the frequency of sex in same-sex relationships was higher among men than women, as might be expected, it was not higher than reports from opposite sex relationships. Their number of lifetime partners, however, was higher. Among all relationships, dating, cohabiting, etc., respondents in same sex relationships reported just under 18 lifetime partners, while those in opposite sex relationships reported around 10 and a half on average. When we look at some uh, same data set, the Ad Health study, perceived an actual non-monogamy in their current sexual relationship, right? 20% of women, and these are mostly heterosexual, think their partner has had another sexual partner. 23% of those women admit they themselves have had another partner, okay? That's a pretty tight uh, 19 and 23. Among men, men are much less likely to presume their partner has cheated, almost twice as likely to say that they've cheated themselves if you want to call it cheating, which this group does not wish to. And if we break it down among uh, orientation, or I should say identity, see that the highest percentage of people who were the respondents admit having had another partner in their current relationship, 42.9% of homosexual men have admitted that, right? 43.2% of bisexual women, actually quite comparable in their sexual behavior patterns. So, I think we have, all right, this is from my study, New Family Structure Study. 20% of women, 23 to 39 year olds, unmarried, said they had ever had another sexual partner while, uh, they, were, while they had been married or they were cohabiting. 26% of men. So, 20 and 26, fairly comparable to that number, the top number, 20, 28. So, in step with data from the National Institute of Study of Adolescent Health, the New Family Structure Study, National Study of Family Growth, all of these nationally representative, population-based, good stuff, that data set also notes that multiple partnerships are far more common among gay men than among lesbians. 62% of homosexual men report having two or more same-sex partners in the past year, compared with only 21% of homosexual women. So gay men have more partners, but perhaps not as much sex overall as heterosexual men. Why? Well, in keeping with sexual economics expectations, it's not that gay men wish to have more partners than straight men. I'm not convinced they do. It's that they are far more apt to be in relationships that permit non-monogamy because their relationships 
are with men who tend, on average, to be more permissive than women. One might expect, given the gatekeeping role that lesbian relationships would exhibit both low levels of sexual frequency and greater stability. While the former is unclear, the latter is not true. In fact, in the National Representative data set entitled How Couples Meet and Stay Together, which drew upon the same data source as mine, that New Family Structure Study, Stanford demographer Michael Rosenfeld notes a lesbian effect on relationship instability. Two men are likely to stray yet remain together. This is the reality of monogamish. Two women are simply more apt to break up than either two men or a man and a woman. Back to natural law thinking about marriage. If marriage has something to do with sexual fidelity, permanence, and the welcoming of children, and Professor Robbie George asserts so in his book on marriage, marriage between women or between men will, on average, strike out on two or three of those. Both, of course, are unable to bear children apart from a male-female relationship, except by assistance. And each suffers uniquely from either fidelity or permanence issues. But heterosexual couples aren't exactly golden either, right? As the Ad Health and the NFSS data revealed, the subject of monogamy and its discontents is not limited to gay men. My research team interviewed 124 to 32 year olds in person, in depth on their relationships. The word monogamy itself emerged in dozens of those interviews, even though we never brought the term up. Something is going on. What exactly is going on? Exactly what we ought to expect, Anthony Giddens would say, and I would agree. Sex has become relatively cheap, economically speaking. But the ramifications of cheap sex are just beginning to unfold on a panoramic scale. What's happened to sex is a little bit like what's happened to locally owned boutique shops in the wake of big box discount chain retailers. It's cheap and plentiful. While demand has remained fairly stable and predictable over time, supply has increased dramatically. Cheap sex has been facilitated by three distinctly technological achievements. Wide uptake of the pill, mass-produced high-quality pornography, and actually the advent of online dating services. Makes us cycle through all these things very quickly and efficiently. All three of those things are actually price suppressors that have significantly altered how people experience the mating market often in ways, though, that are invisible to the people in those, that mating market. It's created a massive slowdown in the development of significant relationships, especially marriage. It's put the fertility of increasing numbers of women at unwanted risk, driving up demand for infertility treatments, and <coughs> arguably has even taken a toll on men's economic and relational productivity, causing fewer of them to be considered marriage material than previously. When more men are off the mating market, of men that remain, women have to compete for them. When women compete for men, men win. We know what that means. Giddens plays neutral on this stuff, but nevertheless, he yielded two warnings 21 years ago, before the internet age. He said, and I quote, we should expect male sexuality to become troubled and very often compulsive. <laughs> he said that before the internet. And, he said, it would certainly not be right to suppose that childhood has remained unaffected by the world of pure relationships. 
I think. But what of the future from here, given these realities? What will marriage look like in 2015 or 2025? Here are my best guesses, and I could be wrong. They're educated guesses. It's difficult to imagine that as hetero, American heterosexual marriage rates continue to decline and the average age at marriage rises, that somehow marriage will become the preferred relational arrangement of American same-sex couples. Far more likely is that after pent-up demand is met and the novelty has worn off, civil marriage will be selected by proportionally fewer gays and lesbians than heterosexuals. In part because marriage entails tradition. It remains embedded in expectations about permanence and sexual fidelity, values more tightly held when you have a man and a woman negotiating a relationship than when you have either two men or two women. In other words, marriage is old-fashioned. It's not cosmopolitan. It's the stuff of Lubbock, not Chelsea. But some will marry, especially the most traditional among them. The best man in my own wedding came out of the closet about 15 years ago, and he got married in Massachusetts. Shouldn't surprise anyone. He and I come from the same small northern Michigan town. If any gay man would marry, it would be him. Marriage is in his cultural script. Not so for many of his peers. This is what sociologists call selectivity. That is, the kinds of people that marry are often different, more sacrificial, less risk-taking than the kinds of people who don't marry. But if gays and lesbians uptake marriage at rates below those of straights, it's likely that those who do marry are more like straights in terms of norms about commitment, romance, love, relationship skills. But in keeping with the principles of sexual economics and current empirical evidence about gay and lesbian relationships, I assert that not one template of marriage will emerge with gays and straights more or less hewing to the pattern uh, of straights. I think there's only three templates. After all, the etiology and the common experience of gay and lesbian life are quite different from each other, as scholars increasingly attest. They are political bedfellows, and that's about it. The more the movement achieves its political successes, more you will see truth-telling among them and the social breakdown of movement solidarity. But if sexual economics understands men and women correctly, on average, then we should expect gay men's marriages to look differently than lesbians' unions. As the data suggest, the former will be the most likely to have extramarital sexual partners. We dubbed it adultery back in the day, we still do so in heterosexual marriages. But such additions are more common, not because gay men are gay, but because they are men. This is more about gender than sexual orientation. The tension around what they call extradiatic sex is simply not as dynamic among many gay unions as it is among men and women. Judith Stacy, sociologist at New York University, and no fan of mine, concurs. She said, they're men. She believes it's easier for them, right down to the physiology of orgasm, to separate physical and emotional intimacy. Lesbians and heterosexual women tend to be far less comfortable with non-monogamy than gay men. I didn't say it, but I believe it. American heterosexuals and most lesbians still powerfully prescribe deviations from the norm of monogamy, even if their own relationships fail to set longevity records. Dan Savage disputes this mentality, but he recognizes its persistence. Lesbian marriages, on the other hand, will hew toward genuine monogamy, like straight ones, since women, on average, pursue less sex less single-mindedly than men, Two women should conceivably, over time, pursue sex even less intensely than in straight marriages, where you have a primary pursuer and a primary gatekeeper 
subject to variation. Two gatekeepers, however, can spell a more rapid decline in sexual frequency. While certainly roles will vary from couple to couple, sexual economics nevertheless would expect less sex in lesbian unions than in straight ones, on average. And studies have already hinted at that. As noted a bit ago, lesbian marriages will break apart more rapidly than the other two combinations. And we've already seen that in data from Scandinavia. Of course, it's not as if the duration of straight marriages is anything to brag about. But we should expect lesbian marriages to be the briefest over the long run. Why? Because women are less tolerant of suboptimal unions than men are. 70% of divorce proceedings are filed by women. Judy Stacy and her fellow sociologist Tim Biblars note this very phenomena in their review of research on lesbian parents, asserting that even in their small snowball samples of privileged white upper middle class lesbians, they had somewhat greater risk of breaking apart than comparison samples. Do they said to their higher standards of equality. Third, how might gay and lesbian marriages affect the marriages of the rest of us? This is probably the most challenging thing to predict. Given the slow pace of cultural lag that typically emerges after poignant technological or political change. I mean, we have the pill in 1960, but I think only in the last 20 years has the, has the mentality really taken root. Such shifts are Im likely impossible to detect over five or 10 years. So any claims about how gay marriages have or have not affected straight ones to this day are premature. Cultural change takes a lot longer than that. And even then, it will be empirically impossible to pick apart future marital trends and state with confidence that one particular change came about because of the uptake of gay marriage and another one did not. So we're going to be out of luck, probably labeling causation. My simplest and best guess is that heterosexual marriage in the future will be become rarer still because gay marriage is arguably an indicator rather than a cause of the general deinstitutionalization and pullback of marriage in the broader culture. Now, a second guess of mine concerns same-sex marriage and how legitimate heterosexual women consider them. Why women? I mean, we already know that women support same-sex marriage at levels well above men for reasons we can talk about at a different time. Why should it matter what heterosexual women think of two men marrying. Plenty. To begin with, adultery just doesn't work the same way in a significant share of gay men's unions. Instead of a single standard, couples negotiate and renegotiate what their standards are going to be. This is why Dan Savage can call nine extramarital partners being monogamish rather than a serial cheater. Theologian and social theorist John Milbank asserts that when the definition of adultery has got to be tweaked, the exclusive sexual union risks <coughs> ceasing to be perceived as having unique relevance for marriage in general. We're not there just yet, but the bridge is being built. So if gay marriage is perceived as legitimate by heterosexual women, it will eventually embolden boyfriends everywhere, and not a few husbands, to press for what men have always historically wanted but were rarely allowed, sexual novelty in the form of permission to stray without jeopardizing their primary relationship. Discussion of openness and sexual partners and straight marriages will become more common, just as the practice of heterosexual anal sex got a big boost from the normalization of gay men's sexual behavior in both contemporary porn and in the American imagination. It may be spun as empowering women, but it sure won't, sure doesn't feel that way.
Influence upon marital norms will continue to favor male perspectives over female ones because men's interests have more currency in the contemporary mating market, largely because high quality men are getting rarer and because women no longer need men to socially, culturally, and economically succeed in life. It's just true. And it began with the pill, which split the mating market into two, punished women who preferred marriage to something less than marriage. Finally, sex will continue to invade the public sphere insofar as marriage and religion retreat publicly as well as in our private lives, leaving a world seemingly bereft of the transcendent, the everyday wonder that comes from seeing your children grow up, marveling at the resilience of your own marriage, basking in the graces afforded by the church. In a world that increasingly misses transcendence, it should not surprise us that sex, sexual expression, should emerge as a more public value. Sex is the new opium of the masses, the temporary heart in a heartless world. Unfortunately, something so imminent as sex won't, indeed it cannot function in the manner in which religion can, has, and does. Sex does not explain the world. It is not a master narrative. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that those who unconsciously demand that sex function like religion are going to come up short. So it really is a brave new world. Go back and read your Huxley. He called it a long time ago. We have to have our eyes wide open and hang on and do a lot of praying. Thank you. Mark, in his talk, and mentioned a number, number of times uh, the aspects, to, to use the words that he actually used, uh, plastic sexuality, he talks about uh, Judith, Judith Stacy and the importance of uh, the difference between males and females in terms of the, the, the physical differences that, that exist. And as I uh, was uh, contemplating upon the response that I would give for this talk, the aspect that uh, came up to me, that came to me was the, using my background as a neuroscientist, to uh, give some perspective of how one of the aspects that we need to do is to keep our minds open and to look at what physiology teaches us, what neuroscience teaches us in terms of how the brain works. We all hopefully have one, uh, but um, it's unfortunately an aspect that is often forgotten. We tend to forget to take into account our human physiology. And that's the aspect that I hope to cover very quickly here. So I, I called, uh, named my talk as how human behavior, how it actually contributes to who we are, but it's also how our behavior contributes to what our brain becomes, what, our, uh, what we become. And that's a bit of a neurobiological perspective. So what I expect uh, us to hopefully walk out of here with is an understanding that the brain is involved in regulating behavior. An understanding that it's affected by both genetics and environment. And I think a lot of that came out in the talk that Mark gave us. It's capable of adapting to changing um, stimuli. It changes its wiring depending on the inputs. And it's able to alter the behaviors as a result of this wiring. So it needs to be understood that we have quite a bit of control on what goes on in our brain. And how we behave also affects our brain, the way our brain functions, and how the brain function um, affects our behavior in turn. So it's a cycle. It's a continuous cycle. So what we hope to ultimately get from this also is the fact that an integrated understanding of what human being a human being is, taking into account sociological psychological, physiological, moral, putting it all together gives us a better understanding of what it means to be a human being. And knowing that the better we understand ourselves, the better we can, uh, the better we understand our nature, 
the better we understand ourselves, the better we can deal, heal people, heal ourselves, and work with others for, the better, for a better life. Many, for a long time, I guess, the brain was thought to be just one organ. That thought has long gone. We, we know now that the brain consists of numerous parts. But there are a number of aspects that I wanted to focus on. The major aspect I wanted to focus on, and that's described in the, this next diagram, is a major distinction between the upper brain and the lower brain. With the upper brain being involved in more executive function, and the lower brain being involved in more impulsive behavior. This is a distinction that we know exists, have known exists, exists in animals, exists in humans. And this distinction, this distinction cannot be negated, cannot be refuted. It is a fact. It is documented. I find it amazing many people uh, don't actually comprehend and understand what actually goes on in our brain that helps us communicate and function the way we do. And I wanted to uh, briefly expose you here to what it sounds like when your brain is actually communicating. get the idea. These are cells being recorded in the brain. This is how the brain, the cells in the brain communicate. This is the language of the neurons. This is in the same way that we talk about different countries, different peoples having different languages. Different neurons in the brain fire in different ways. Different neurons in the brain will sound differently because of the way they communicate with each other. So, how does our brain affect our behavior? How does our behavior affect our brain? The key aspect that tends to be used where people, where, where it's beneficial um, and on the other hand ignored where people feel it's contradictory to uh, their own agenda is this concept of plasticity. Plasticity is the ability of the brain to change and alter itself depending on the inputs it's receiving. Initially, it was thought and I would say probably even just going 20 years back, that the brain stopped developing once we were born. We now know that that is very far from the truth. The brain continues to develop and change as we grow, as we grow older and has a very, uh, very large capacity to change and alter itself depending on the, on the inputs it's receiving. What you're seeing up there, pointing with arrows, is these are mice that are trained to do a reaching task. The brain is filled with these little tiny spines. The neurons have these little tiny spines that increase the surface area for communication. Imagine yourself, if you have two ears, you can only take so much input. If you had four ears, you'd take in more input. To a certain extent, you can compare these neuronal dendritic spines to the ears of the neurons. So depending on the tasks, depending on our behavior, our neuronal wiring changes. You'll get spines that will disappear, others that will appear. So when we talk about plasticity, there's a couple of uh, things that need to be kept in mind. It's different from excitability. Excitability is how the brain can be stimulated. Plasticity is how it can adapt to change. It gets complex. And the idea of what I wanted to show up here, if you look in the diagram to your right, uh, what you're seeing up there is a single a single uh, um, spine. That single spine around it, if I may just point that out, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I, I think I missed one because there's about 10 inputs coming into a single spine. Now, a dendrite looks something like what you have here. So it's not just one single spine that re is receiving these 10, 12, 15 inputs. And the brain has to decipher all of this, integrate it, understand it, and then act upon it. Changing the spines causes changes in our behaviors. 
as we get older, as we go through the teenage years, pu uh, puberty and adolescence, um, the brain functions on the principle of use it or lose it. Connections that are not utilized will be removed. Connections that are utilized will be reinforced. And this is why you hear the term, you know, my children are like sponges. They absorb everything. Their brain is at that point where it is just absorbing everything as much as it can in order to be able to uh, form these connections, which ultimately later on in life will be either reinforced or lost. So how does plasticity apply to life? We know that in drug abuse, and I do not intend in going in detail, the point of what I wanted to show here was a very brief summary, very quick summary, just very sk skimming the surface here, of the evidence that we have of this, um, this uh, concept of plasticity. Drug abuse, we see a change in, uh, in spine density. And this obviously then ultimately affects learning, memory, and all the aspects that are associated with brain function, including emotions and uh, movement. In multiple sclerosis, we know, for example, that increasing exercise leads to a reduction in the progression of the disease, a slowness in the disease. Why? Because the brain is adapting to the inputs that it's, it's getting. Learning skills. Many seem to, to uh, you know, we all know that we learn. But what happens when we learn? What happens when we learn is our brain changes the communication, the connections that exist within it in order to reinforce or to basically remove unnecessary con connections. It's been shown that early life stress causes both structural and functional changes within the brain. And stress itself causes changes in an adult neurogenesis, not in child, in adult. Hippocampus is involved with memory, and that's one of the aspects that obviously one would expect to be uh, affected in a situation where, uh, um, where there's uh, stress. An aspect that is very closely associated, associated with what Mark was speaking about is oxytocin. Oxytocin is you'll see it in lay terms referred to as the love drug or the love chemical, um, which is a term that I disagree with because love is not a chemical. But oxytocin is a chemical that is involved in bonding and that is there is no denying that aspect. It causes reversible ultrastructural modifications, changes in the way the brain connects. It's known, we know now for a fact that it's involved in pair bonding um, mating, social interaction, and it's involved in mediating beneficial consequences of sex and motherhood. Different types of attachment cause different parts of the brain to be uh, stimulated, and at the same time, there is also an overlap. But again, oxytocin and ultimately dopamine are involved in this, these plastic changes that occur in the brain. Plasticity in relationship, just very briefly here, very quickly. Dendritic spine density changes, and it's influenced by sex, by the estrus cycle in animals, and also by motherhood. Sexual experience, this is actually interesting. Six significant similarities exist uh, between the neurological pathways and the functional morphological changes that take place due to drug abuse. If you're talking about sexual, sexual behavior, you're talking about the limbic system. You were talking about the reward system. If you're talking about drug abuse, you're talking about exactly the same neurological system. We, we, um, maternal separation from pups has been shown to cause changes in the way the brain is connected. Partner preference. Sexual arousal is conditionable in women and men. Parent-child relationships. Uh, there was a recent paper that was published here in 2013 that looked at uh, male aggression in mice with towards children that are not their own. Yet that aggression is removed when that male is with a female and that female bears its own children. And finally, religiosity and behavior. This is my, probably I think my second last one here. 
religiosity in behavior. Religiosity influences the way we behave, and therefore religiosity is also involved in some of these physiological changes that take place. We know that religiosity is involved in the way we respond to stress. We know that religiosity is associated with uh, quality of life and mortality. And also, religiosity is associated, inversely associated, with uh, destructive behavior. So increase religiosity, you reduce destructive behaviors. Therefore, the point that I wish to put across here is that in considering the global picture of what we are seeing happen around us, and the, the, the description and the information that Mark gave us, we need to also take into consideration how we function at the physiological level because this is not purely some superficial cloud of ideas that is out there and that has no basis to it. The basis to it, some of the basis to it can be seen if one takes a moment of time to actually investigate what, how we function as physiological beings. Therefore, I emphasize again the need for us to always keep in mind this ability to integrate the spiritual, the psychological, the physiological and the environmental influences on the way we ultimately behave and on human behavior. And the way I summarize it often is using this diagram where the inner circle or the inner part of the diagram basically describes the biological aspects. We're genetic beings, our genetics do to some extent have an influence on our behavior, the way we behave then ultimately acts upon the environment, the environment acts upon us, that action of the environment acting upon us causes changes within our physiology that ultimately goes back into this cycle. But ultimately as human beings we also have the moral side of it. And the moral perspective of humanity is, enables us to change our behaviors, to restrain our behaviors. I always use the example, if I get a drug, uh, rat addicted on drugs, on amphetamine, that rat is never going to come up to me and say, Would you, could you please hold off the next dose because I'm really not feeling too good. Likewise, if I took a male rat and put him amongst a number of female in, females in heat, that rat is not going to be saying, I need to watch myself and be a gentleman here and watch my behavior. As humans, however, we do have that capacity of restraining our behavior. So being Franciscan University and my favorite saint, Saint Bonaventure, um, tells us a lot about the fact that it, through nature we can see God. And I think we have often uh, forgotten that aspect. And it's something that we need to come back to the aspect of focusing on understanding our physiology, how we work, and the process of understanding how we work and how we function at the physiological, at the material level, we can then see our creator and the intentions of our creator potentially in a better light. And I hope that from these points that I've brought up, you have hopefully been able to take the importance of understanding uh, the way our brain works the way our physiology works, and also being able to uh, put together the, the, the idea that understanding how we behave at the sociological level, how we behave at the moral level, what's going on at the more physiological level, then put together there, we have what the human person ultimately is. Thank you.